All plausible moral theories agree that increasing the happiness of currently existing people during their lifetimes is intrinsically good. Despite, or perhaps because of, this agreement, surprisingly little work has been done to figure out what the most effective ways are to improve world happiness. In this short talk, Michael will share his current conclusions and identify where more research is needed. He claims that contrary to the apparent consensus within EA, poverty and physical health should not be top priorities. He suggests we focus directly on mental health, pain, and what he calls ordinary human unhappiness instead, and sets out some ways we might do that. Michael Plant is studying for a DPhil in moral philosophy at the University of Oxford. His primary focus is finding the most effective ways to in increase world happiness. He works on population ethics, moral uncertainty, and the value of saving lives. Michael is the founder of Hippo, a startup building a happiness tracker training app. After two years, he decided to stop working on it to concentrate on philosophy instead. Michael's thesis is supervised by Hilary Graves and Peter Singer. Michael is currently helping Peter Singer write a book on population ethics. Please welcome Michael to the stage. Hello, everyone. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here speaking to you today. So if you ask effective altruists what are the best ways to do good, they will tend to suggest you should focus on uh, preventing existential risks, global poverty, or factory farming. And these correspond respectively to concerns for future people, current people, and animals. Um, and despite uh, the Will McCaskill's exhortation that we, sh we should be on the lookout for cause X, causes which allow us to do more good than the ones we're currently aware of, nothing seems to have changed very much in the causal list over the last couple of years. People have shifted from prioritizing one to the other. Uh, lots of people move from current people to future people, but actually the, the top items on the list haven't really changed. So it's in the spirit of uh, intellectual exploration, I'm going to be a weirdo saying, I think, probably false things, but I don't know which of them are false, so I, I look forward to you, you telling me what they are. So today I'm going to be focusing on, uh, just on current people, and more narrowly I'm going to be focusing on um, improving the happiness of currently existing people whilst they're alive. And by improving happiness, I also mean reducing unhappiness. So we might not think happiness is the only thing which matters, but we will agree that it is one thing that matters, and certainly it, it matters a great deal. So today I have a, a negative and a positive thesis. My negative thesis is that, effective, is that the things effective altruists currently focus on, where they try and help currently existing people, so um, poverty and uh, neglected tropical diseases, probably don't do as much to improve happiness as we would imagine. And then the positive thesis is that we should focus on pain and mental health instead, and I'll set out a couple of ways. Uh, of doing that. Um, I'm trying to cover lots of material, so I'll cover it quite thinly in the interest of trying to uh, get to the end. So um, I'll just kind of tell you how the analysis, how I think the analysis goes in lots of places rather than uh, go through the arguments in, in great depth. Um, so uh, I'm going to define happiness as the net balance of positive conscious states over uh, negative conscious states. Positive conscious states are those which feel good to us, that we like, that we enjoy. Examples include elation, pleasure, and contentment. So this is kind of a fairly standard Benthamite view of, of being interested in just how good and bad people's lives feel to them. So I won't say any more on the definition of happiness. Um, I'm going to assume happiness can be measured in a, in a meaningful scientific way. Uh, I'll be pleased to defend that some other time, but I, I won't do so here. And the, uh, the typical measure I'll just talk about is life satisfaction. So economists will ask people, overall, how satisfied do you feel with your life these days um, on a 1 to 10 scale? So as I said, I won't be arguing for every point, and if I say I don't have, if you hear me say I don't have time to talk to that, time to talk about that uh, more than once, then um, I hope you'll forgive me. Um, I confess I don't yet have a top priority for the most effective way to improve world happiness. So those of you who, who may be rustling for your checkbooks, I'm afraid I don't have anything to you for you unless you're going to send them to me. That would be obviously greatly appreciated. Um, okay, so. When we think about reducing misery, we tend to focus on poverty. This isn't just true in the EA world, this is true more generally. But recent work by economists such as Richard Layard um, and others have found that if we um, look at big data sets uh, from, from the developed world and we um, ask people about their life satisfaction, the other things going on in their life, if we look at mental health, physical health, um, relative income inequality, unemployment, partnership, and levels of education, the single biggest predictor of being in misery, misery is the bottom 10% of the life satisfaction scores. So if, you've got a, if I ask you how satisfied are you with your life and you say I'm a four out of 10, you're, in the, you're definitely in the bottom 10%. The biggest single predictor is, is mental health. 
And uh, when they added up not just how many suffer, but by how much, they, are, they, they, they argued that if we were to eliminate any one of these things, the thing which would, do, which would do the most to reduce misery would be mental illness. OK, so I, I, sort of, I, I, I share this information with a, with a few people and uh, within, within and without the effective altruist world. And they say, OK, fine, we can, we can kind of believe that mental health is really the thing we should be focused on in the developed world. But surely in the developing world, it's just going to be more effective to focus directly on poverty instead. So let's turn to that. So a charity you all um, will be familiar with is uh, Give Directly. Give Directly provide unconditional cash transfers to, to poor Kenyan farmers. They've had a couple of RCTs done on their, uh, done on their work. Um, so in this particular study, they, um, they randomized in a village. So some people got given cash, other people didn't get given cash. And they measured the, uh, and they measured the people over time over a period of 15 months on a basket of psychological well-being measures. And what they found is that, um, is that, it, is that the recipients had their life satisfaction and other members go up. So you can see that's the kind of little line there. And then it went down over time. So the main effect was short term. Um, what they found, curiously, was that the non-recipients, those who didn't get the cash, were really annoyed about it, and they had their life satisfaction go down, and go down quite considerably. And they didn't find this on the other measures, that I think that was non-significant, but you can, you can kind of see what's going on there. Um, so uh, what explains this? Well, both of these findings can be explained by, um, uh, by two mechanisms. So one is hedonic adaptation, and the other is social comparison. So hedonic adaptation... Um, is the idea that nothing feels very good or very bad to us for very long. So various shocks to your life, such as um, becoming bereaved, being a victim of crime, going bankrupt, uh, uh, becoming very ill, these all tend to affect people's life satisfaction for up to 12 months. And after that, people are, are back where they started. So this explains the kind of attenuation over time. It's very hard to make people happier for long. The other thing is social comparison. So the way we judge our lives is um, often just in comparison to other people. So if you make some people better educated or richer, they feel more satisfied with their lives, but then the people who are poorer and less well-educated then correspondingly feel worse. So hedonic adaptation and social comparison combine to explain the Eastlin paradox. The Eastlin paradox is the finding that over the, uh, the last few decades, although people have got much, much wealthier, and you can see the, uh, this is from a number of countries, you can see the, the red lines going up from bottom left to top right. Although people have got much wealthier, um, overall average life satisfaction has not, has not increased. It's remained broadly flat. Um, and this is despite the fact that richer people are more satisfied than poorer people, and richer countries are more satisfied than poorer countries. And so the thought is that as we all get wealthier, uh, nothing really changes, but, um, so we adapt to that but then it's always better to be richer than, than other people. So the, uh, the, sort of the, the thinking from the, the economists who look at these subjective well-being measures is they're just quite pessimistic about the capacity of economic growth to improve the human lot. There's some argument about, um, that there is some debate between economists uh, about the Eastland paradox and exactly uh, how it holds, but um, I don't have time to go into that here. Um, and perhaps the most shocking finding is from China. So between 1990 and uh, 2010, the, um, even though the, the GDP of China went up very substantially, the number of people in poverty um, went from a third to a tenth. Average life satisfaction went down. I don't have a graph for that one, though. And it's only come up uh, more recently. But it's still probably lower, economists think, than where it was in the 1990s. OK, so if what I'm saying is true, then why don't you believe me? Um, I don't believe me either. It turns out that our um, uh, more research uh, explains that our intuitions about um, what makes people feel happy just aren't very good. So this is sometimes called hedonic forecasting or effective forecasting. And the basic idea is that we're just not very good at predicting um, our future or other people's emotional states. And there's a number of bits of this that I, I don't have time to go into, but, the, um, but one of the things which is easy to grasp is focusing illusions. So if I ask you to imagine what's it like to live in California or to be very wealthy or to, uh, or to become disabled, we will focus on the salient differences between our life and that life and forget uh, the, the rest of that person's life, um, and not accounting for the fact that they will adapt to those things and they will, again, um, compare themselves to other people. So as uh, Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman once pithily put it, nothing, feel, uh, uh, nothing matters as much as you think it does when you're thinking about it. So uh, I, just, we should, I just basically encourage us to distrust our intuitions about what make, makes people feel um, happy or not and, uh, and go with the evidence instead. 
OK, so let's try and put some life satisfaction numbers on Give Directly. I've got a couple of calculations here. These are just supposed to be illustrative rather than uh, final. So it looks like Give Directly increased household life satisfaction by, by about 0 0.3 points on a 10-point scale. So that's an equivalent for taking me from 7 to 7.3. This was measured after a few months. You'd expect more adaptation to occur after that. But let's charitably assume that uh, this is about 0 0.3 points for a year. There's five people in a household. Uh, I'm assuming, and that the, sort of the, the donation is about $750. So your donation to give well, uh, sorry, to, to give directly gets you 1.5 life satisfaction points, $750. This is ignoring any of the comparison effects. So equivalent from taking me from six to 7.5 for a year. Um, you may not think that's very big, but we'll, we'll come back to that. Okay, so perhaps I've made you feel a bit pessimistic about give directly, and you're thinking, well, okay, maybe if we shouldn't focus on poverty directly, why don't we just go for health instead? So I'm going to uh, give you some more worries. So we could look at the, uh, we could look at the Against Malaria Foundation. I'm focusing on improving lives. Um, the value of saving lives is a different topic which requires um, philosophical rather than empirical analysis. And this, so this is a different idea. Um, for what it's worth, I'm not convinced that whatever your beliefs on population ethics and the badness of death, you should think the Against Malaria Foundation is the most effective thing to give your money to. And I've um, argued that a little bit online, uh, but I'm not going to go into that here. Um, what about uh, giving to SCI, the Schistosomiasis Control Initiative, which I'm very proud I managed to say. Um, so GiveWell argues that the main benefit of SCI is not the short-term health gains from deworming, but the long-term economic benefits. So people stay in school longer, um, they can earn much more in later life. But I've, I've just been sort of suggesting to you that we might be a bit pessimistic about the capacity of economic development to improve the human lot. And if SCI's main benefit is economic, then we should be, uh, we should be worried about how much um, that actually does to increase happiness on aggregate. Okay, so that's my, my negative thesis. Um, I mean, did we, should we just give up? Is everything we do incredibly ineffective? Well, I think there's actually plenty of things we can do. Um, I think we should focus on non-adaptive, non-comparative problems, so the things which make people feel better or, or less, less bad for a, for a long time period. And I have three things on my list. Um, so I have mental health, pain, and ordinary human unhappiness, and I'll explain sort of the nature and scale of these problems, then I'll say what we can do about them. So there are many mental illnesses, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, so on, but I'm just really focusing on uh, depression and anxiety. These are the two big, these are mood disorders and they affect about 250 million people each. Um, those might be slightly low estimates in the UK. It looks like about 12% of people at any one time have uh, some form of depression or anxiety. Um, and this is a seriously neglected problem. So one third of low and middle income countries do not have a designated mental health budget. And of those that do, the average expenditure is 0.5% of their total health budget. So uh, a global uh, center for development report describes this as a truly neglected area of global health policy. And we know that there are a number of um, uh, problematically neglected areas. This leaves us with a, a very big treatment gap. So the gap between those who need treatment as a percentage who don't get it is about 65 to 85%. So a huge number of people suffer and don't get any help at all. OK, pain. So if I tell you that pain is a major problem, you, you might find this a bit surprising. After all, pain is not really a problem we encounter in our own societies. And that's because if you are um, dying from something horrendous, then you can get morphine to, um, to alleviate your pain. But this is true in the developed world, but not really in the developing world. So this is a, this is a map of um, use of opiates uh, sized for, for population. And what you can see is that the developed world um, consumes most of the world's opiates. So of the 300 metric tons of opiates of, um, uh, that get produced each year, about 0.1 tons goes to low and middle income countries. So the WHO estimates that about 40 million people are in need of palliative care each year. This excludes the uh, the use of uh, painkillers or, or, or um, morphine to um, uh, help treat people in, in surgeries and so on. Um, about 78% of them live on low and middle income countries, and only about 14% of people who need palliative care get it. And what I think is rather sobering is that of the about 50 million people that die in any given year, about 25 million of them die in pain, pain that is incredibly cheap uh, to prevent. So if you were to ask me what is the most cost-effective thing we could do to increase happiness, I would suggest you find someone who's in lots of pain and give them morphine. It costs about a few, dollar, uh, sorry, a few pence a day for an effective dose, and the problem isn't, uh, and the problem isn't really, uh, really financial. A, um, a Lancet study estimates that the pain gap could be closed for $150 million a year. That's what we would need to meet all of the world's 
um, un unmet, uh, unmet sort of uh, requirements for pain medication. So why does this happen? Can people simply not afford this? Well, no, the problem is in a different area. The uh, WHO um, explains the problem is regulatory. So people are worried about um, misuse of opiates. So a lot of stories coming out of America at the moment about opiophobia, overprescription of opiates. There's a kind of a, a different problem in the developing world, the sort of opiophobia, opi opiophobia people scared of opiates and um, are just kind of, uh, they're not sort of prescribed enough. An additional problem, because this is seen as kind of a low priority area, is there's a lack of training and awareness um, in, about palliative care amongst health professionals. Okay, ordinary human unhappiness. Imagine we solve all of the world's mental health problems, we remove all, all the pain, all the, uh, uh, all, all the poverty. You thought this was a talk on happiness and actually we're just focusing on the bad stuff. But uh, so let's say we've got, got rid of all of that. Well, presumably there's still a gap between where we are then and maximum possible happiness. So I'm calling this ordinary human unhappiness and it basically refers to how can we make our ordinary mundane lives more exciting. Um, and by stipulation, this is gonna affect everyone, um, including everyone here. I don't, uh, I don't have time to talk about this today, so if you want to know how you can be happy, I'll have to, have to ask me to speak another time. Uh, so what can effective altruists do? I've got six options here I'm going to go through um, relatively briefly. So the first, so I'll talk about pain and then about mental health. Um, for pain, uh, I've kind of already given the game away. The, uh, the problem is, is a regulatory one. So what seems to be required is um, drug policy reform and, um, and healthcare reform in the developing world. Um, with lots of these things, I don't really have a a top pick for exactly what should be done. I mean, my, my research has only got me to the stage where these just look like areas which need further investigating. So in this case, um, it looks like what might be the promising thing is, uh, pu is public policy reform in the developing world. So um, lobbying to try and drive it up the agenda rather than say, um, trying to get the WHO to do something about it because they, they're already aware that this is a problem. So uh, yeah, I don't have a, a top pick or really even a, a particular pick there. Second, um, mental health, so, I'm, so there's, there's basically two ways we can try and deal with mental health. There are cognitive solutions, so talking therapies, and then there are chemical solutions, so you can give people one form of drugs or another. Um, we could do the thing that effective altruists are already familiar with. We could find uh, effective charities in the developing world and, um, and, and provide individual uh, support. So there are a couple of charities which do this, such as Strong Minds and Basic Needs. Um, and uh, now I want to give you a quick cost-effectiveness comparison between Give Directly and UK mental health. Okay, so research from, and we'll extend this to developed world mental health. So uh, research from the UK uh, suggests it, it costs the government about $750 to provide um, psychotherapy to one person. Lots of people believe that um, psychotherapy doesn't work. Actually, it, uh, it does work in about 50% or slightly more of cases. And the average impact for your, 650, uh, for your $750 is this improves um, life satisfaction by 0.4 points for five years. So this is actually an incredibly long-lived, um, we've only had data up to about five years that I've seen, but it has a really long effect, and it doesn't, it doesn't sort of adapt away. You, you provide um, cognitive behavioral therapy to someone with, uh, with some form of depression or anxiety, and, and the effect really sticks, and this is just astonishing compared to, to everything else. Um, if you think that 0.4 life satisfaction points is small, um, for, for reference, if, you double, if I were to double your income, that would improve your life satisfaction by only 0.3 points. So, so, so 0.4 is big, and there's nothing else as big in the literature. So a bit of simple maths, uh, you get about two life satisfaction points for $750. This compares to 1.5 life satisfaction points um, for Give Directly. And the thought is not that we should give money to the UK government to, do more, uh, to, to provide more mental health care. I've got mental UK mental health. Whatever. Um, but the thought is that probably if we can do this in the developed world, um, and it already looks more cost effective, we can do this much more effectively in the developing world um, with some of the charities I mentioned earlier. And part of the, uh, part of the, the difficulty is, um, even though this, if the treatment is, is very cheap, the challenge is, is finding people. So the, the total cost of the treatment needs to be borne in mind. Number three, we could encourage the governments in the developed world to try and expand access to mental health care. Um, I think this one is, is curious because the economic case for mental health is already so strong. So um, speaking to um, uh, Paul Freiters, an LSC economist, uh, just recently, and he, he, argues that, um, he argues that if the UK um, funded extra mental health care, because this causes a reduction, because people who are treated for mental health um, use, uh, use the NHS so much less for physical health problems, 
that this treatment would pay for itself in a couple of years. So there's, there's actually a really strong economic case for this sort of stuff. Um, we could, the things I've mentioned already for mental health, these are in-person therapies, but we could try and do electronic therapies. There's a bit of evidence for, um, for uh, online CBT and other things. So I was working unsuccessfully on, a, on, on my own app, which I've, I've now called Time On to try and make more money in philosophy. And um, uh, so, but I, mean, I, so I, I, think, I don't think I'm going to get here with this, but I hope that someone else does. And I know at least one other EA working on this. And this is really a challenge for entrepreneurs rather than um, philanthropists. Okay, so that's the cognitive side. What about the chemical side? Um, so we could try and expand uh, access to antidepressants in the developing world. This is also a challenge. Uh, similar to uh, access to, to opiates. Um, so I've labeled this AMF for Prozac, and I think this is maybe not a totally stupid idea. I, uh, I haven't looked into the details, but there, but there might be something, something on this. Um, many people think antidepressants don't work. They, uh, they don't seem to help people with mild and moderate depression, but they do seem to be useful uh, for about 60% of people with severe depression. So they're actually, uh, there is something that can, can be done there. And finally, I want to say a bit about the use of psychedelics to treat mental health care. So uh, I've mentioned that cognitive therapies work for some people, about half of people, and antidepressants work for some people as well, but that still leaves a, 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 that still leaves a, a large number of people who experience treatment-resistant depression, where you provide a number of therapies and nothing really seems to improve the condition. And there's been um, some recent very exciting work using psychedelics to see if we can uh, to, to see um, uh, which, which have been shown uh, to be quite effective. And by, by psychedelics, I mean things like um, LSD and psilocybin. Psilocybin is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, which I'm sure none of you are familiar with. And um, so this, this is one study, Carhart Harris and others, they gave a single dose of psilocybin to 12 people with moderate to severe treatment resistant depression. Um, rather terrifyingly, the subjects have been depressed for a mean average of 17.8 years. That's a long time to be depressed for. They, uh, they provided a, a dose of, of psilocybin. Uh, the, the patient was sat next to a couple of psychiatrists, and they were allowed to go on a, a mostly uninterrupted inner journey. Um, after one week, two-thirds were classified as non-depressed, and 42% uh, were classified as not, as not depressed uh, after three months without a need for, the, for further treatment. So this is really quite astonishing if you consider that these people had been uh, depressed for like very, very many years, and uh, this was, had managed to make even some progress, uh, think, I think, suggests that we need to take this seriously as an area for, for much further research. There's lots of other things to say about, um, about, about the use of drugs to, uh, in, for both medical and, and potentially recreational purposes. Um, but I'm just, and so uh, I've got a, uh, an article that I've written with Lee Sharkey on this. So I think that, that there's some stuff here which, although it may sound um, pretty weird, uh, I think is actually surprisingly promising. And I think the, the medical arguments are are quite good for both opiates and for psychedelics. So what needs to be done here? Um, it's not obvious what the best thing to do is either. I'm afraid I'm, I'm giving you a lack of answers. So um, the current restrictions on psychedelics mean that it's very expensive to conduct trials on them at the moment. So maybe one thing to do is to try and nudge, for instance, in the UK, the Home Secretary to change the regulation. And that might decrease the costs of running trials by about uh, 10 times, five to 10 times. Um, or it might be just, just the most effective thing to do is just to fund the research at its currently restricted level. So there'll be kind of phase one and phase two trials happening over, happening over the next, uh, next few years, and they might need things like uh, up to 50 million pounds to try and make those happen. Okay, so uh, here are my conclusions. Uh, in the slogan, I think effective altruists should target misery, not poverty. I think trying to improve people's inner lives by changing the world around them just seems like a kind of a, a long-winded, indirect approach, and, we could, and it seems much more uh, kind of intuitive just to try and change how people feel by, by changing how they think. Uh, I think uh, mental health and pain are cause areas that should be taken seriously. I think much more work needs to be done, but I think already um, treatments for mental health look potentially more cost-effective uh, as ways of improving um, happiness than, um, than using them. So thank you very much. I really appreciated that talk. I love getting a new angle on all of our concerns. Uh, you have quite a few uh, audience questions, but I thought I'd start off with uh, one of the concerns that people had that you sort of addressed in your talk. You said people are uh, worried that, um, you know, worried about opioid use, 
for instance. And one of the worries that they have is that it's going to have negative unintended consequences. Um, insofar as you think you can address this question, uh, what sorts of things can we do to ensure that it actually has boosts in happy, happiness without these externalities? Yeah, okay, so, so this, is, this, is, um, this is slightly different from um, what I was fo focusing on. So there's, um, in, in the US, there's now an increasingly well-known problem with overprescription of opiates. So it's just too easy to get access to, to these painkillers, and then doctors realize you're addicted, and they, with, they, stop, uh, they stop prescribing you, and then people uh, turn to heroin and so on, and that's kind of a, a bad situation. So, that, so the chat. So this is this is a very this is a totally different topic from from um, it's, it's got an interesting problem, but different from what I was focusing on today. So that's to do with the, I think uh, largely the way kind of the U.S. sets up its healthcare system it doesn't seem to be as substantial a problem in the rest of the developed world. But that's really a problem of how we organise our healthcare um, apparatus, and if we do that well, then we can um, probably avoid lots of the problems while getting. Um, lots of the benefits. I mean, it certainly seems true that, uh, that prescribing no opiates is, is under prescription. Um, and there's a large unmet need for pain, um, for pain medication, which we should try and do something about in the developing world. Great. Um, someone else from the audience said, uh, notwithstanding difficulties in measuring subjective well-being for animals, would many of your arguments also make a compelling case for improving the welfare of animals? Good. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, that's a question I haven't, I haven't really thought very much about. I've, I've written something on wild animal suffering, um, and kind of if you're, if you're taking this stuff seriously, one way of, uh, if you're worried about wild animal suffering, would be to um, suggest we build AI-controlled drones which kill um, prey, such as gazelles, at, at the end of their life, right before lions eat them. And you might think that if you're taking this stuff seriously, then that's where the argument goes. Uh, I don't... Uh, yeah, I don't, really, I don't really know what to say on, on that. Fair enough. If you'd like to engage with such conversations, where should a person in the audience go? What's the appropriate website or forum uh, to talk on? So, uh, I'll have to think about that, sorry. Okay, fair enough. Um, I guess look him up online and you can figure it out from there. Thanks again for speaking with us. Okay, it's great. been great.